I'm going to talk to you this evening about epidemic theory and epidemiology. This subject is one that is comparatively recent and the terms are unknown to most people. The word epidemiology itself means upon the people and indicates that a disease has descended upon the people as a pestilence. Our theory and scientific work in this field is comparatively recent. But although the scientific work is recent, epidemics have been recognized from time immemorial. Primitive people saw disease descend upon them, and they thought that they had incurred the wrath of their gods. They gave a religious interpretation to the event. We find records of epidemics in the Bible. We see that epidemics have destroyed certain races of people. One striking instance of this was a big epidemic that occurred among the Indians in Massachusetts the year before the pilgrims landed. Their landing was made possible by the fact that an epidemic had wiped out a major portion of the Indians of that region. And so epidemics have been observed by primitive people from the beginnings of time. But it's only recently that we've had the development of the theory. The possibilities of the theory arose when we knew the origin of disease, when bacteria were discovered, and we found that Diseases were transmitted from person to person by transmitting these disease agents, the bacteria and the viruses. Then we had the beginnings of epidemic theory. We saw these epidemics in striking practice. Uh, smallpox was particularly noticeable. In the early days, for instance, in Baltimore, when smallpox was not prevalent in the city, a ship would come to the port carrying a sailor who had had smallpox, and as he moved among the people of the city with his case of the disease, he transmitted that disease to some of the people of the city. Those individuals in turn transmitted the disease to other individuals. And before long, we had a full spread epidemic of smallpox. This created the notion that the epidemic was a natural flow of the disease process through the people. And the epidemic theory attempts to study and explain this natural flow. We must not expect any epidemic theory to cover all diseases. Each disease will have its own epidemiology, some simple and some complex. Malaria, for instance, is one with a complex epidemiology. In this case, an individual who has malaria may be bitten by a malaria-carrying mosquito that mosquito then picks up the disease and becomes an infected mosquito, a diseased mosquito. That mosquito, again, biting another individual, will transmit the disease to that other individual. And thus we have the disease moving from individual to mosquito back to individual. Malaria, again, has relapses of its cases, and this increases the complexity of the study of malaria. So each disease will vary in the degree of its complexity, but we may hope to understand the process if we can understand the flow and may see how to develop the science of epidemiology for any particular disease. Once the scientists realized the cause of diseases, realized the virus, the uh, bacteria that was in the air, in our food, in our water, he could then develop somewhat of a theory about epidemics. But it's the nature of a scientist that when he has a problem, he must develop a theory, a theory that must be proven and proven conclusively. So first, I'd like you to take a look at this epidemic theory that has been developed by the modern scientist. The work on epidemic theory in the mathematical sense is over a hundred years old. William Farr, the great epidemiologist in England, developed a mathematical equation to express the epidemiology of smallpox and applied it to one of the great epidemics of smallpox in Great Britain. Twenty-five years later, he applied this theory again to an epidemic of cattle plague that threatened to destroy all of the cattle of Great Britain. Uh, his work in the cattle plague was so dramatic that it was reported in the House of Commons and had its effect in the measures that were taken to control the cattle plague. Work of this sort was carried on by other men following far, and we have mathematical expression for the epidemiology of several diseases. 
I shall not attempt to go into the complex cases this evening, but shall take up the simple case uh, that is represented by measles. The case where the disease is transmitted from the sick person to a susceptible person and from a susceptible, uh, the susceptible person then taking the disease and becoming ill. We call that a simple person-to-person -person transfer of the disease with no intermediate agent. We may represent that process in a population city as follows. The people in our city will be made up of various types. One type will be the susceptible people. Those are the people who have not had the disease and are capable of taking the disease if they encounter a case. And so the cases are the other people in the city that make the epidemic possible. It is the cases meeting the susceptibles and giving them the disease that give rise to the new cases. And so any mathematical equation will have to express the flow of the disease from cases to susceptibles to new cases. The mathematical equation that's been developed for this particular case is represented as follows. The cases in the subsequent time period, which might be two weeks later than the initial start of the epidemic, is equal to the susceptibles at the time period multiplied by a factor which is the probability that those susceptibles will meet some one of these cases, C sub T. So the equation T sub T plus 1 equals S T times 1 minus Q to the CT power is the mathematical equation for the epidemic. That seems complex, but is m more simple uh, than it looks. We might symbolize that by diagramming some of the people involved. Here is an individual that would represent one of the susceptibles, an individual in flight because he is hoping to escape from this individual who is the case. And so here we have the case of the disease pursuing the susceptible. If the case does meet the susceptible, then that susceptible will become a new case and will be taken ill and have the disease himself. That's the fundamentals of the process. The epidemic flow would be represented by a situation of this sort. A group of susceptibles in the population uh, who are individuals who have not had the disease and may acquire the disease if they meet a case and a case introduced into that group of susceptibles. If the case here meets one of the susceptibles, for instance this one, then that individual becomes ill and he becomes a new case. If that case meets another susceptible, then that susceptible becomes ill. And we might say that that case has given rise to two new cases. That would be called a epidemic logical rate of two, one case giving rise to two. The next stage of the process would occur with measles approximately two weeks later when this case had recovered, and he then goes into an another class of people, the immune, the people who have had the disease and are no longer in danger of having the disease. And so in the next stage of the disease, this case becomes an immune, the person who is happy to be through with the process. He's had his case and is through. However, he's passed it on to these two cases, and those two cases are now the cases that continue the epidemic process. They are the cases that are circulating with the, in the population and may have contact with the susceptible. If they in turn meet this susceptible, that susceptible will come down as a case. If they meet this susceptible, that susceptible will come down as a case. And so we'll have the susceptibles constantly moving into the category of new cases as they encounter the old cases. These old cases are then would become the immune and we have the natural flow then of the disease into the susceptible, susceptible flowing to the new cases and the cases as they recover flow into the immune. That represents then the flow of the disease in the population. The thing that we are studying and the thing that is represented by this epidemic 